Hello, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C., and thanks for joining us in our Get Farsighted in 2020 webinar series. We're excited to have you guys with us, and we're going to be covering each part of the FAR every Friday throughout the entire year. So as you guys know, the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, are is the rule book for how the government purchases. Um, as I mentioned, our webinars are complimentary and recorded, so if you're not able to stay on for the duration today, uh, the recording should be available later this afternoon or uh, at least by tomorrow. We'll have it posted on our YouTube site uh, and also on our website. Uh, first, we want to thank our partner, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition. Uh, they're a nonprofit trade association focused on veterans and SDVOs. Um, more about the NVSBC can be found on their website, which is listed here on your screen. We also want to thank our sponsor, Open the FAR, um, appropriately uh, named and, uh, and a good resource for the FAR. So a quick uh, blurb about us. We are based in Washington, D.C., and provide various services for federal contractors. We work with large businesses and mid-sized companies um, that fall in the product, uh, services, and software categories. Some of our services are listed here on this slide. And more about our, uh, our company and our services can be found on our website. Okay, so today our speaker is Frank McNally. He's with Public Spend Forum. Uh, he's got over 10 years of experience in the, uh, the government contracting sector. And today he's going to be covering FAR Part 1. Um, and Frank, really good to have you with us today. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to you and just let me know when you're ready for the next slide. Thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Um, yes, yeah, so it's good to be with you all today to discuss FAR Part 1, which covers the Federal Acquisition Regulation System. Um, we, uh, we will be sort of using the sort of openthefar.com, which is the, the sponsor and the website uh, I was able to create with some partners uh, with the intent of making the FAR easier to interpret and understand. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just a good resource. Check it out. It's, it's free to use, um, nothing to download at openthefar.com. And uh, you'll see some screenshots from that system as we go through. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. All right, I always like to start sort of these these parts, and if you joined us for the summary overview of this, uh, you'll know that there, the Federal Acquisition Regulation exists as a way to administer the government's discretionary budget, right? So we spend between $450 billion annually at the federal government um, that's discretionary funding on contract, and it is governed by the Federal Acquisition Regulation. Um, which is codified in Chapter 1 of Title 48 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And the way it's structured um, is as follows. There's subchapters, um, which group all of the relevant FAR parts into some logical organization, uh, parts, 53 parts in the FAR. Um, then each part is made up of subparts, sections, subsections, paragraphs, and subparagraphs. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and here, those subchapters, you can see A through H. Uh, the first four parts are in subchapter A, which is the general uh, subchapter, and that covers um, definitions, which we'll do in the next part. Well, it covers part one, which is the federal acquisition system. Uh, part two, definitions of words and terms. Part three, improper business practices and conflicts of interest, and then administrative matters in part four. But our focus today is on part one. Uh, the Federal Acquisition Regulation System. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, we'll show you sort of what this pertains to. So there's seven subparts uh, in part one, and they cover, and this is a bit of a laundry list, but I kind of put it up here for demonstration purposes. The purpose, authority, applicability, issuance, arrangement, numbering, dissemination, implementation, supplementation, maintenance, administration, and deviation of the Federal Acquisition Regulation System. I think we have just about every single bureaucratic adverb or word in this particular sentence. Um, so, uh, it, but it's important because that's what the, the that's what subpart or part one actually does. 
uh, a colleague and I were, were talking yesterday about this. You know, I told him I was doing this webinar. Um, and he said, you're doing an entire webinar in part one. I said, that's incredible. That's part one is it. That's the best part of the FAR. Uh, it gives us, us being acquisition professionals, um, contractors, contract officers, representatives, anybody who deals in government contracting, part one gives us the freedom to do pretty much anything um, that's uh, a result of the exercise of sound business judgment. Um, as we'll talk about a few times in this webinar, if it's not prohibited, um, we have the authority to do it. And part one is what tells us to do that. Um, this gentleman, colleague of mine, Ben McMartin, also said, you know, part one is it, everything else in the FAR, all the other 52 parts are just band-aids that have been created from problems that other people have discovered. Um, and, and I think basically what he means by that is we had to have other parts to basically govern our, our sound business judgment um, and to administer, supplement, maintain, uh, and, and help us understand how to, how to do all those things in federal acquisition. Uh, top to the next slide, please. So, you know, the purpose, like I've said, of the FAR is to uh, codify and publicize uniform policies and procedures for acquisition by all the executive agencies. Um, there's a statement of guiding principles here, section 1.102, that uh, I think is worth reading. Uh, I'm not going to do it right now, of course. Uh, but it is definitely worth reading for every new professional, young and old, and now at the beginning of a, the new decade, um, one that I think might be quite exciting, uh, it could be a good time to review exactly the statement of guiding principles. So I think this is a, a well-timed webinar. Uh, and I want to read, I do want to sort of call out my, uh, my first favorite paragraph in the FAR. So if you could click to the next, it'll advance and it's going to bring something up for us here. Yes, yes, this is paragraph D. Uh, uh, paragraph 1.102D of the guiding principles. Now, the reason I want to call this out is because I said earlier that part one really gives us the freedom to do anything within sound business judgment. Um, that's true. Here it is. We have, and the role of each member of the acquisition team, and we'll talk about that acquisition team, their role is to exercise personal initiative and sound business judgment to provide the best value product or service that meets the customer's needs. As we exercise this, judgment and initiative, we can assume that if the strategy is uh, or strategy, practice, policy, or procedure is in the best interest of the government and the customer and is not addressed in the FAR, nor is it prohibited by law, it is a permissible exercise of authority, a PEA, a P. So permissible exercises of authority, eat your peas. It's good for you to do this and the FAR lets us do this. It, it directs us to do this. And it's why part one is so exciting. Um, but it's also how, why we have to understand sort of how the, the rest of the FAR is put together. Um, so personal initiative, sound business judgment, uh, these are further clarified in subsection 1.102-2, which is performance standards. And I'm going to go through each of these in the next, uh, next slides. So go ahead and advance on. All right. So there's effectively three performance standards that are uh, are relevant there's this um, and it's all in, in in the in the um in the in the name of satisfying the customer in terms of cost quality and timeliness right so we have to do that satisfy in terms of cost quality and timeliness um, but we also need to promote competition minimize administrative operating costs conduct business with fairness and integrity and ultimately fulfill public policy objectives Okay, but first, how are we to satisfy the customer in terms of cost, quality, and timeliness? Number one, communicate with the commercial sector as early as possible to determine what is available in the market. Um, you might remember uh, a few years back, OFPP did this entire series of myth-busting memos uh, to clarify how contracting professionals are to communicate with industry. Um, and it's all sort of tied back to this particular part. Uh, we are directed as contracting officers to conduct market research, to talk to industry, to communicate with vendors, to learn what's in the market. There's no other way to do this. You cannot do this from a cubicle. You can't do this from what's in the FAR. You have to communicate uh, with the commercial sector. You can do that in a lot of different ways. Um, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. Uh, we also need to employ planning as an integral part of the process. 
of acquiring products and services. But we need to be flexible, right? We can't just be beholden to our plans because if something changes, we need to be able to accommodate that change. And boy, do they ever change. Everything changes. Plans are good to have. Um, and and uh, there's an entire part part seven of the FAR that deals with acquisition planning, but we can't be beholden to that. We must be ready to accommodate, to be flexible, um, to exercise learning agility and uh, make changes on the fly. All right, so that's performance standard one. Next slide, please. All right, administrative, uh, minimize administrative costs. I like this one a lot too. Um, specifically, we are told by part one, not to make rules, policies, or, or, this is very important, or internal policies. That means those internal policies and procedures that you may be making in your office right now, or you may be holding to in your office right now, we should not make those unless their benefits clearly exceed the cost of their development, implementation, and enforcement. Now, raise your hands if you think every single one of your internal policies uh, has a benefit that clearly exceeds the cost of its development. I don't know if everybody's raising their hand out there, and I doubt it. Um, I've worked in the government. I worked uh, as a contracting officer in the government. I can definitely tell you that we had certain internal policies that uh, I think everyone would have agreed uh, whose policy, whose benefits did not clearly exceed the cost of their development. Um, so, you know, there's that. Probably can't solve that today, but uh, be mindful of that going forward. It's a new decade. Maybe resolve to not make policies or internal policies that uh, that don't um, outweigh the, the cost of their delivery, implementation, and enforcement. And enforcement. Uh, we're also in the interest of minimizing administrative costs, directed to provide uniformity when essential, but encourage innovation when it's not essential. Basically, this is saying. We should have uniform contracts whenever we can. We have a uniform contract format for commercial um, products and services and formal source selection. Um, but we also need to be able to innovate and be not uniform when it's essential. Um, there's an entire category of sort of like FAR-ish contracts called other transaction agreements that basically arise from this. Uh, there's other types of contracts. It, it, when I was in the, a contract officer, uh, I believe we were one of the first divisions, and it wasn't myself, it was a, a colleague of mine, um, a dear colleague of mine. She did the first award term contract in our office. Award term contracts are not defined in the FAR. So we created award terms because it was an exercise of sound business judgment, and it was essential to achieve what we were trying to achieve. And so we innovated. It was awesome. All right, next slide, please. We'll get to this final um, performance standard. Conduct business with integrity, fairness, and openness. High lofty ideals we should all strive to attain. Um, and in order to do this, we first have to have a competent, experienced, and well-trained workforce. I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a coming sub part. Um, but you are all part of that workforce, so congratulations. Thanks for being here. Uh, efficiency also requires us to shift from uh, risk avoidance to risk management. I wish I could double bold that. Um, I know you want to avoid risks, and I know there's not a lot of incentive for contracting officers to take risks in the government, um, but let's see if we can unshackle ourselves from that in this particular decade, uh, start to deal with risk management. I think the principle here is that you cannot avoid risk. It exists. Well, really, the only way to avoid risk, I guess, is to just not do anything. Um, so we should instead seek to manage risk, and we can manage risk with contract clauses, performance plans, uh, evaluation methods, award plans, all kinds of ways that we can manage the inevitable risk. Um, that will arise when you exercise discretion, use sound business judgment, and comply with applicable laws and regulations. So that's part of uh, conducting business with integrity, fairness, and openness, is we do have to comply with laws and regulations, but we can apply them um, through our, our, our own discretion and professional judgment. Finally. We are to treat all contractors and prospective contractors fairly and impartially. But again, double underline, not everybody has to be treated the same, okay? There is, and I think this is, it was in the myth busting series, but there is this sometimes this false notion that if I meet with one contractor, I'll have to meet with all the contractors. Well, that's not necessarily true. Now, if you divulge some information that's material to your solicitation, 
um, and you could determine that there might lead to some degree of partiality as a result of that disclosure, yes, you need to disclose that to everyone. But, um, and this is important for any contractors out there, uh, business development, informing requirements, gaining a competitive advantage is not illegal. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unfair about that. That's just contractors should have that opportunity to go and create, um, you know, their own competitive advantage. And that's why the FAR says we don't have to treat everyone the same, just fairly and impartially. Hope that's an understandable distinction there. Next slide, please. All right. Um, before I get to the role of the acquisition team, I, I do really quickly want to talk about the FAR conventions in Section 1.108. Um, and these conventions basically provide guidance for interpreting the FAR. Um, and by the way, I want to just a shout out to a, a, an old professional um, and a teacher, Vern Edwards, who, who taught me um, it, through his course, the FAR Boot Camp. Uh, how to interpret the FAR. It was a wonderful course. It was a one week intensive deep dive into the FAR, um, but the FAR boot camp uh, probably led me to uh, where I am today professionally. So, anyways, there's a couple of conventions in the FAR that help us gu uh, uh, interpret it. Um, words and terms, which are the definitions in part two. And if you're sticking around for a noon session, you're going to hear more about that. Uh, delegations of authority, basically, you can, as a, as a um, vested Age, official of an agency delegate certain authorities. There are dollar thresholds. You all know what the, probably what dollar thresholds are, simplified acquisition thresholds and other thresholds that are observed um, and under which you can do certain actions and not others. Um, application of changes to solicitations and contracts. Of course, you know that the uh, FAR, uh, as it applies to your contract, um, is time stamped. Effectively, like the date of your award, that contract award, um, is basically the time and is a time capsule. So the FAR can change. We're going to talk about how the FAR can change. But the date of your contract award is the date at which the FAR is, is applied. So a lot of times, contracting officers, legal uh, specialists will have to go back and determine what, uh, what a particular clause or section might have said at that time. Now, fortunately, there's, you know, not, this isn't. You know, this, this happens sometimes, but it's not the kind of a rampant thing. Um, there's citations. Uh, you know, this is cite, citing executive orders or other circulars or policies or, or anything like that. Um, and then imperative sentences. Uh, and an imperative sentence is basically is a directing the action. So you, you shall. If you see the word shall in a sentence in the FAR, that is an imperative sentence. Um, that is where the FAR is actually saying, here is your here is your discretion. This is what you shall do. So shall is a very important verb in that in that part. Okay. Um, the rule, uh, sort of the acquisition team, right? So uh, the role of the acquisition team is to empower everyone to make decisions within their areas of responsibility um, with the contracting officer having the authority uh, to apply the rules and regulations on a specific contract. Um, I think it's also important to note that the authority to make decisions and the accountability for the decisions, according to FAR Part 1, should be delegated to the lowest level within the system. I think that's really important. Uh, having worked in, in the government, um, not every decision to be made needs to rise to the level of a head of contracting activity or even to the level of a division director or contracting officer. Some things need to just be done. If we had to get everything approved, um, we would never go anywhere. Uh, I'm sure sometimes it probably feels like that, that every, every little decision has to be signed off or, or vetted or authorized. Well, that's a risk avoidance behavior. Uh, we need to move more towards risk management. Train your people, help them understand what discretion is, what judgment is, and then trust them. Um, no mistake can, can be uh, is, is set in stone. A lot of things can be approved or corrected later. So that's the role of the acquisition team. Let's go on to the next uh, slide, please. Um, and one more click, because I want to call out this, which is my second favorite paragraph in the FAR. Can you believe I have two favorite paragraphs in the FAR? That's uh, the kind of nerd that you need to go and create your own, your own federal acquisition regulation online. Okay, so this is, um, this is actually paragraph E. So, okay, so 
if it relates to the acquisition team, if a policy or procedure is not specifically addressed in the FAR, nor prohibited by law, uh, the team should not assume it is prohibited. Rather, absence of direction should be interpreted as permitting the team to innovate, to use sound business judgment, to do things that, uh, that lead to business process innovations and ensure best value decisions. As a father of three, I've got I've got two uh, toddlers who are old enough now to to make decisions. And um, you know, if they tell me you didn't say that I couldn't make a fort in my room all morning, um, I have to kind of smirk at that because that's right. That that has to be a permissible exercise of their authority. I did not say they could do those things. So this actually gets used against me quite often. Um, but that's a uh, that is just fine, of course, because I want them to, to succeed. I want them to explore, uh, just like we want all of our acquisition teams out there to uh, assume that uh, the absence of direction um, is actually permissible. All right, now we can go on to uh, to another favorite part of mine um, on the next slide, which is how to cite the FAR. So if you want to sound like the professional, uh, go give subsection 1.105-2 a read, because this basically tells you how the FAR is arranged. Um, it will really help you uh, uh, navigate the FAR, find what you're looking for in the FAR, but also sound professional. So when you're citing the FAR, it's important that you that you do so. So you probably heard me say paragraph or subparagraph, subsection, subparts, parts, et cetera, right? So uh, the way to, to cite the FAR um, verbally is to understand that uh, where the decimal place is, okay? So if you're looking at uh, um, a, a part of the FAR, there will be no decimal, it will be part 25 or part one. Now, once we go to the right of the decimal, that's gonna determine the, the, the leading of, um, adjective that we use to describe. So if it's 25.1, that's a subpart. That would be subpart 25.1. Um, if there are additional uh, figures to the right of that um, of that of that decimal, uh, that's going to be a section. So 25.108 would actually be section 25.108. After a dash, that's going to be a subsection. So 25.108 dash two, that's subsection 25.108 dash two. And then you have paragraphs. If there's a a, a, a an alpha numeric character, well, I guess it's an alphabet character, right? In parentheses, that's a paragraph. So then you would say it would be paragraph 25.108-2A or B or C. Okay, you're probably thinking, why does this matter? Well, um, it, it, it doesn't, I guess, but it does sort of from professionalism, from a professionalism perspective. If you're a young contracting officer or contracting professional out there and you want to sound like you know what you're talking about to your elders, learn how to cite the FAR correctly. If you're a vendor um, or a contract attorney that's just getting started out uh, and you wanna be prepared to deal with the the, the, the the elders in your contract office, they will recognize if you know how to cite the FAR correctly. Um, we, we the, the, the FAR nerds of the world, um, do kind of take this stuff seriously. Um, and so I definitely recommend knowing how to cite the FAR correctly. All right, um, next slide, please. So now we're gonna start talking a little bit about the administration of the FAR, which is covered in subpart 1.2. Um, yeah, so these are actual pictures of the two councils. Uh, you didn't know that. These are the actual pictures. These are the actual councils that uh, administer the FAR, the Defense Acquisition Regulation Council, the DAR, and the Civil Agency, the Civilian Agency Acquisition Council, the CAA. Of course, I'm joking, but these uh, these two councils administrate the FAR um, and uh, and kind of represent um, the the uh, you know any changes that need to be made, any coordination points. Um, there's somebody at points of on the on the Defense Acquisition Regulation Council. You'll have appointments from um, any of the the DoD components on the Civilian Agency Acquisition. A council, you'll have appointments from any of the civilian agencies. And these people, I assume they meet in dark rooms uh, or, or um, you know, very distant locales to make really important decisions about how uh, government discretionary funds are spent. 
Um, and these trusted advisors uh, kind of keep us straight with the FAR, um, and it's an important job. Now, there is also uh, other um, conventions, the FAR Secretariat, which is basically uh, managed by the GSA. The FAR Secretariat publishes the FAR. They maintain the official record of the FAR, um, which is at acquisition.gov. Uh, that's the official um, regulation um, uh, online, but you know, there's others to open the FAR. Uh, we pull it right from acquisition.gov. Uh, so it's it's timely, um, but you know Walter Skluer, uh, I guess, is the publisher has been for a long time for the printed version of the FAR, which is basically um, out of date on delivery. Um, but it's helpful. I'm looking at mine right now. Mine is let's see, mine is from January 2012. Uh, so I still use this uh, as as a reference guide as a desk manual, but I'll always go and look um, at open the FAR. Uh, because I know that's that's recent, but now if you're making contract decisions, legal decisions, I do recommend acquisition.gov for the official record um, at that particular moment in time, although we scrape pretty quickly. All right, so um, after that, there uh, there's basically um, uh, agency compliance. So as you know, every agency that's an executive level cabinet agency, with the exception of the Federal Av Aviation Administration, is beholden to the FAR. Um, it's the responsibility of the Secretary of Defense to ensure that all DOD components are complying with the FAR. It's the responsibility of the GSA Administrator to ensure that all civilian agencies other than NASA are complying with the FAR. And it's the responsibility of the Administrator of NASA um, for ensuring that those rocket scientists are uh, complying with the FAR. I'm sure that's no easy task. Uh, rocket scientists, pretty smart people. Okay, uh, on to the next slide, please. I hope you all appreciate these jokes. It's 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 early um, in the new year, but I'm I'm trying to get my dad joke game as high as possible. So this is good practice. Okay, on to subpart 1.3, uh, agency regulations. You'll hear these talk uh, called agency supplementals. Um, basically, every agency has their own set of supplemental regulations. They supplement or implement the FAR and incorporate agency policies, procedures, clauses, provisions, and forms that govern or inform or control the relationship between the agency and its contractors. Now, it's really important for both contracting professionals in the government and contractors outside of government to ensure you comply with both the FAR and the agency supplements. Why? Well, next slide, please. There are deviations from the FAR, okay? So deviations, uh, and you can have a, a, um, a class type deviation or individual deviation, but these deviations are basically codified in agency supplements. I'm really glad the National Veteran Small Business Council is a partner here because in Open the FAR, um, one thing we try to do is, is help uh, professionals see the, the federal acquisition regulation side by side with its supplemental. So the first supplemental that we brought on to Open the FAR was the VA acquisition regulation. So if you go to openthefar.com right now, look at any part, you'll see on the right that there's a VAR supplement page. Um, if we can go to the next slide, actually it's gonna go to click one, it's gonna circle that sort of eight, uh, section 801.4 deviations from the FAR. Now go to the next slide, and you can see how these deviations from the FAR are administered in subpart 801.4 of the VA acquisition regulation. Um, individual and class donations, click twice, it's gonna, actually I think click one time, it's gonna put a nice big yellow box around individual deviations versus class deviations. You may be interested in knowing what that is. Um, but why are these deviations important to know? Um, advance to the next slide, please. All right, so here's, well, in my opinion, this is why we think it's important to be able to see the, the FAR guidance side by side with the, an agency supplemental, in this case, the VA acquisition regulation. Probably one of the most famous uh, FAR deviations from the last decade and potentially in the history of the FAR, which dates all the way back to like 1982, gosh, I was two years old, um, is the one um, in, in section 819, sorry, subsection 819-501-70 in the VA acquisition regulation. This is the rule of two um, for service disabled veteran owned small businesses. And this came about um, through a pretty 
famous or infamous, depending on um, you know, your perspective, Supreme Court case uh, called Kingdomware, which was effectively um, a, a veteran-owned business that uh, interpreted the Veterans First Contract, uh, Veterans First Contracting Act legislation very literally um, to mean that VA should only award contracts to service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses when there are two or more um, capable concerns. And this was litigated between VA, not because VA doesn't care about awarding to veteran-owned businesses, but because it's a pretty significant implication, if you think about it, uh, to have to award every single contract action to a service disabled veteran known small business when there are two or more. That's pretty that's pretty big time. So they needed to uh you know to litigate this to the fullest extent they did. You know, it started in uh as a GAO as a yeah as a GSA protest or GAO protest by a company called Aldevra, then got taken up by Kingdomware and got backed by I'm sure a pretty big consortium of uh of uh you know of legal concerns and Kingdomware eventually went through the Court of Federal Claims and ultimately to the Supreme Court, which was a pretty exciting time for, for contracting nerds. So anyways, my point being, this is why supplements are important because if you, uh, let's say you're a contractor um, and you're not a service disabled veteran owned small business and you're pursuing something at, um, at, at VA, you need to know that, you know, if there's two SDVOSBs that can do what you do, um, you, may, uh, you may not be able to make that make that uh, or be part of that award okay so understand how the supplements work understand how um, uh, agency supplementals will deviate from the far and be sure to check the supplemental for the relevant agency um, that uh, you're either working in or trying to do business with all right next slide let's go on to subpart 1.5 and this is agency and public participation okay um, Part of the acquisition team is, by the way, the, the contractors, the private sectors. So they are part of the acquisition team. Uh, they need to know the FAR. But uh, because the FAR governs this half a billion dollars of, uh, of, of discretionary spend, your tax dollars, you, us, me, we, uh, we all need to have public participation in how rules are changed. Um, if there is a significant revision to the FAR, Subsection 1.501-2 establishes the opportunity for public comment. And you can see this. This happens in the Federal Register quite often. I think the probably the most um, significant revision that was attempted uh, last year in 2019 was uh, a decision to raise the simplified acquisition threshold. So this had to get posted in, um, in the Federal Register, which it was uh, in this, in, uh, early October. Uh, it was open for comment for two months and effectively uh, it will lead to the simplified acquisition threshold being raised from $150,000 to $250,000 and uh, the, the micro purchase threshold being raised from three and a half, I'm sorry, $3,500 to $10,000. So that's a significant revision and therefore uh, it was open for public comment. Um, so, definitely pay attention to what's happening in the Federal Register in terms of public comment, um, and it's a neat way to engage and get be a part of sort of rulemaking. You know, you, you anybody can can make a comment or make a you know uh, share their two cents on that, so to speak. Okay, next slide, please. Subpart 1.6 deals with career development, contract authority, and responsibility. So. Um, the basically the responsibility for uh, administering an agency's discretionary spending on contract falls to the agency head. Um, they are uh, they are technically the ones that are vested with that responsibility. Now, agency heads, we're talking about your secretaries, right? The, the people that run your agency. Relatively busy people. Uh, and so the FAR um, and subpart 1.6 and specifically section 1.601 um, permits an agency head to delegate the authority uh, to manage the agency's contracting function to a head of contracting activity or an HCA. 
sometimes they'll call a senior procurement executive or a chief procurement officer. If you're in the Department of Veterans Affairs, there's a lot of different head of contracting activities, um, and and the titles are uh, are are um, are varied. But effectively, the secretary of an agency can delegate responsibility for um, for for contracting down to the head of contracting activity, who then uh, has this uh, uh, responsibility and uh, and and um, ability to appoint contracting officers to warrant them um, in accordance with. Uh, OFPP guidance. Uh, then, of course, the contracting officer has the opportunity to designate uh, contracting officer's representatives to serve on their behalf and to help them administer the contracts that ultimately get awarded. So let's talk about what a contracting officer um, does. What's, what are their responsibilities on the next slide? All right, so contracting officers, which are described as subsection 1.602-2, they have the responsibility of assuring that the requirements of law, EOs, regular executive orders, regulations, and other applicable procedures, deviations, agency supplements, have been met um, in, in uh, the awarding of a contract. They are also responsible for ensuring that sufficient funds are available for obligation. They have to ensure that impartial, fair, and equitable treatment has been uh, provided to all the members uh, or the parties in any particular contract. And uh, they also have to request and consider the advice of specialists. This can be um, engineers in the development of a requirement. It can be uh, attorneys within the agency for a particular uh, innovative path that they intend to, um, to execute. They also have the responsibility to designate a contracting officer's representative. Um, so on the next slide uh, in section 1.603, there is a selection process. Nobody can just become a warranted contracting officer. Uh, you have to go through a good bit of training, contracting courses, CON 100, 200, and up to 300. Uh, all these standards are published in an OFPP policy letter. Um, warrants do have funding thresholds, by the way. I think the, there's, they have a simple VAT acquisition warrant, which in the new year, this particular year, will be $250,000, uh, all the way up to unlimited warrants, which is basically you know, a blank check. Uh, well, not really, but it means that you can sign a contract for any amount of money um, without limit. So only warranted contracting officers can obligate the, the government through a contract. You know, you'll hear this say only warranted COs can sign the check. So that's true. Uh, if somebody other than a warranted contracting officer obligates the government, we have to go through this whole process of a ratification. Uh, which I was, uh, I won't say fortunate, but I had the experience of, of doing a ratification one time during my tenure. Very interesting, very interesting process. Not exactly something that you want to be on the other end of. Um, you don't want to obligate the government if you're a program officer. Um, that's the contracting officer's uh, um, province. Now, of course, there is one distinction. You can delegate the uh, micro-purchase authority to someone who isn't warranted. Um, Basically, that just means you can you can give someone a P card. There's training, of course, that they, they have to go through, but somebody could can make micro purchases for small commodities. You know, anything now up to ten thousand uh, dollars can be spent on credit card um, or through micro purchase by uh, someone who is not um, a warranted contract officer, but has been delegated that authority by a contract officer. All right, let's talk really quickly about. Uh, uh, the contract officer's representative, and then we're going to start winding down. So on the next slide in section 1.604, uh, the contracting officer's representative, the core. When I started out, we called these COTARs, which I thought was a pretty cool name. Um, but then within a year or two, we started to call them contracting officer's representative, the core. So these individuals assist in the technical monitoring or administration of a contract. They've got to maintain a file with their letter of designation, a copy of the administrative functions, which may not be delegated to the core, significantly signing modifications or signing um, any type of contract document, and then a de documentation of the actions that can be taken in accordance with the delegation. So uh, becoming a core is a big deal. There's probably some cores on the line right now. You may have been voluntold that you were going to become the core on your particular contract, or this might have been something that you pursued, but it's a really important role in federal acquisition. So kudos to you if you're out there serving the serving the core uh, role for your uh, particular um, agency or program office. All right, last slide for me is subpart 1.7, which deals with determinations and findings. So 
sometimes we need written approval uh, to take an action. Um, certain actions do require uh, a, a written approval as a prerequisite. Okay, so, uh, and by the way, some of those are, for instance, awarding a time and materials contract requires a termination and fine. Placing an order under the Economy Act against the multi-agency contract requires a determination and findings. Now, a sole source contract action requires a specific type of determination and findings called a justification and approval, um, but that is discussed in subpart 6.3. Okay, so what does a determination and findings have to include? Well, it's got to include the nature and or description of the action being approved, uh, citation of the statutes or regulations upon which the decision is made. Um, shout out the syllogistic reasoning here, by the way. If you're writing a DNF and you want to make sure it gets through your legal attorney, go Google syllogistic reasoning. Um, it's an awesome mechanic uh, to describe things to lawyers. If I have lawyer friends, I talk to them in syllogistic reasoning and they cannot argue back with me. I basically have um, have their goat when I start to do that, okay? So, uh, syllogistic reasoning. It's also got to include findings that detail circumstances, facts, or reasoning that support your determination, uh, and then basically what you're determining, right? They have a, an expiration date and then ultimately a signature of the authorizing official. I had the pleasure of writing several of these um, when I was a, a contracting officer uh, and having them signed um, all the way up to my HCA, I think, one time was, uh, was the highest one of my DNS went, so that was fun. Ooh, okay, that's part one of the Federal Acquisition Regulation System. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Jennifer. I appreciate it. I'm going to um, turn it back over to you now and, uh, and, and rest a moment before we come back at noon for part two. Super. Great information, Frank. Um, it was very insightful and, uh, and helpful for me as well. So thanks for sharing your knowledge, uh, sharing your time. And, uh, and as you mentioned, we're going to dig into part two at 12 o'clock. That's a separate link. It's a separate dial-in. Uh, today's session has been recorded. Uh, it should be available on our YouTube station, and it'll be posted on our website uh, later this afternoon. If you have any questions about government contracting, if you wish to sponsor uh, or work with us on the um, uh, FAR webinar series, you can contact us at the phone number or email listed here on your screen. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, and we hope to um, see you again at 12 o'clock Eastern. Thank you, and this concludes our webinar.